and then my wife Anna, uh, shown here in the forest near uh, Freiburg. In fact, uh, I'm really the second fiddle in this research, Anna's really the driver of this research, but I'm going to pretend that I'm the big shot, uh, for this occasion at least. Um, Bearded beetles are tremendously interesting insects because they're one of the few arthropods that exhibit true biparental care, where both the male parent and the female parent actively invest in the care of their young. It's kind of an astonishing thing for an insect to do. And here's the male and female. What they do is uh, they prepare the carcass by stripping all the fur off it, and they roll it into a really tight, compact carrying ball. And you can sort of tell this used to be a mouse. There's a tail coming out there, right? And then, and then the parents excavate this sort of cavity at the top of the carrying ball where the offspring live and feed on the carcass from the inside out. Um, the, the parents will defend the carcass against predators, defend the carcass against conspecific competitors, and they even feed the young. So these are herd instar larvae, and what you're seeing here, this larva here, is rearing up, exposing its mandibles, presenting its mandibles to its mom or dad, I can't tell which. And what the, the mom or dad has done is they have fed somewhat on this carrion, partially digested the carrion, and then they regurgitate this sort of slurry back to the larva. as sort of a, here's, a, here's your meal. Um, I hope you enjoyed the dinner at the Frankfurt Post. Uh, this is another uh, uh, reproductive unit. Here's another, uh, well, this, this carrying ball is sort of in bad shape, but uh, you, you use what you need to use. But this is unusual, well, not so much unusual, but this is a, a different kind of relationship than I want to show you, because if you count, although typically we think of berry beetles as monogamous, as a single male and a single female, there's three adults here. This is a polygynous arrangement. There is one male here, and there are two females here. And you can imagine, this is a great deal for the male. It's a great deal because frequently carcasses are large enough to support the offspring of more than one female, or that uh, the, uh, the eggs that are produced by more than one female, so that from a male's perspective, you leave more offspring if you can attract a second female. But, and this is an important but, this can be a really bad deal for the female. Because although a carcass may be large enough to support the young of more than one female, frequently they're sort of in between. They support the young of more than one female, but less than two females. So that if you're a female and another female comes along, that may depress your own reproductive success, even if the male that has both females is enjoying an increase in his reproductive success. Well, um, males seem to be aware of the situation, and when you present them with a carcass that's large enough to support the eggs or offspring of more than one female, they engage in sneaky polygynous signaling. Now, this is a male, and I know he's a male because he's got this curious headstand posture. What he's doing is he's calling out in a, in a curious kind of way for another female. You don't know it because another person, he's already got a female. But he's still signaling. The way he does this is he averts his last abdominal segment. There are glands in that last abdominal segment that emit a volatile odor that attracts females from a long distance away. Because he's trying to get another mate. Now, the female that's on here doesn't like this. You know? And so that female, when she smells, and they have very keen sense of smell. The female immediately stops what she's doing, and in this case runs over and climbs up on top of the man to sort of dissuade him from signal. Now she might do that, or, and this is a little harder to see, but here, this is the male. The female will come along and try to undercut him so that he topples over and it can no longer in that pheromone emitting stance. Or if the female gets really, truly grumpy, she will in fact attack the male. So this is the male. This is the female here, and you can maybe be able to see here, her mandibles are wide open. She's trying to bite his abdomen. He's really annoyed that he's trying to signal, and he's getting grumpy back as he's kicking her back with his hind legs to try to get her to go away. Now, part, the most parsimonious explanation for this is that this suite of behaviors by the female has evolved specifically to discourage this kind of surreptitious, or not just surreptitious, polygynous signaling by the man. But how do you actually test that? 
We have kept the idea that that's why this, these set of behaviors are involved in this class. Well, the way that Mom and I did it is uh, we tied up the female. <laughs> this, is, this is the female that's been tied up with dental floss. And she's been tied in such a way that she can get around the carpet, all right. The tethers long enough that she can get around the carpet, but she can't, it's, it's restricted so she can't get at the male who's signaling a few centimeters away from the carpet. And then we had another group of females, a control group, where they also had this tether, but we cut it off here so that the female is still free to run around wherever she wants. That's the, again, I told you, I like simple minded experiments. All right, what effect does that treatment have on the uh, interference behavior of the female? Well, uh, the black bars represent when the female was untethered, the uh, lighter bars represent when the female was tethered. And you can see when the female is untethered, the number of interference attempts she engages in is far higher than when she's tethered. Why? Because when you're tethered, you can only attack the male when he's in reach of the carcass. And what the male does, of course, is as soon as he figures out he's being attacked, he just scoots off a little ways, sticks his rear end up in the air, and starts to signal again. What effect does this behavior have on the pheromone emission of the male? Is that to be an acid test? Come on now. Well, it's the exact opposite pattern, as you would expect, right? So when the females are tethered, the amount of pheromone emission, and this is a frequency distribution for the duration of pheromone emission, the time that the males invest in pheromone emission is way higher than when the female is untethered. When the female is untethered, a lot of the males don't pheromone emit at all because the females basically beat them into obedience. I knew the females would like this part of the story. <laughs> so, um, in conclusion, I, I hope I convinced you that sexual conflict is a normal, invariable part of reproductive interactions between the sexes. It is almost invariable. And that conflict uh, invariably leads to adaptations that are detrimental to individuals of the, of the other sex. So that these traits are best understood not as because they foster some kind of uh, harmonious relationship between the sexes or because they're for the benefit of the species. They evolve because they're the net result of an evolutionary arms race between males and females. I want to end with a couple of acknowledgments. Um, and first, I want to acknowledge uh, the students I've had over the years. I've had just absolutely terrific stellar students that have uh, really enriched my life. And um, Tracy already showed this picture. I, I want to actually identify two graduate students in particular who have just really been instrumental in moving my research forward. And that's been Tracy Ivy, who, who introduced me today, a PhD student, former PhD student of my, my <coughs> lab. And uh, Terry Weddle, who's just been, just been a terrific rock in my lab. And they've been the best PhD students that, that uh, person anywhere could, could want to have. My work's been supported really generously by the National Science Foundation. I've been funded more or less continuously since about 1991. I'm very grateful for that support. And over two sabbaticals, I've been supported by research fellowships from the Alexander von Humboldt Foundation. And that's been very helpful as well. Uh, uh, finally, I want to thank my mom and dad. Uh, they still values in me that perhaps are not, had nothing to do with the fact that I'm a distinguished professor, but more importantly, values that I think, I, I hope, have made me a better person. Uh, people have asked me about my name from time to time, not only how to pronounce it, but where does that come from? But Charlie Thompson, when I got hired, here, thought I was an Eskimo. That's what he wrote. <laughs> He had to fill out the affirmative action form on the basis of my application. He said I was a, 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 an Eskimo. <laughs> Sakaluk, the name Sakaluk is Ukrainian. And translated from Ukrainian, it means literally falconer. That is an individual who uses trained falcons to hunt. And I think you would agree that my father uh, hunted or caught himself a fairly pretty bird here in my mother. Uh, my mother's maiden name is Armstrong. And she comes from the part of the Armstrong clan that got thrown out of Scotland and banished to Ireland. So she's actually from the Irish side of the Armstrong clan. And the Armstrong clan has a model, uh, clan model, Invictus Maneo. And that model means I remain unvanquished. 
And I think if you ask a number of my colleagues, they would say that that is a model that Scott Sackler has tried to live his professional uh, life by. Uh, I remain unvanquished. And if President Bolin would forgive the presumption, I would think that in the 150th birthday uh, year of uh, this splendid university, that we as an academic community remain unvanquished. And with that, uh, I'll say thank you once again. And I, mean, I think I have time for a question. Thank you so much.